Well, welcome to the 10th annual SunWest Economic Forum. Hard to believe that 10 years ago we were in the midst of the Great Recession. And here we are 10 years later with quite a bit of significant change in both the economy and the bank. And so um, we really appreciate everyone joining us. We have our esteemed presenter, Eric Hovde, today here. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, he's the chairman and CEO of SunWest Bank. Uh, he is, he's a quintessential American entrepreneur. He founded Hovde Financial, a uh, investment bank that focused on financial services companies in the 80s, grew that, then started an asset management business that focused on the financial services companies, built that into a billion dollar asset management, a billion dollar long short hedge fund. And in addition, started a private equity firm that bought and sold numerous banks throughout the country and started H Bank Corp, which is a privately held bank holding company, and its largest asset is SunWest Bank. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce and bring up to the stage our in-house economic expert, Eric Hovde. <laughs> I'm all mic'd up, so I, can't, I better not double mic myself right now. So uh, Dwight, there you go. It's great having you all here. Uh, as Carson said, 10 years ago, I can't believe uh, it's gone by so fast, but one thing you learn as you get older in life, life keeps moving faster and faster, and wow, uh, th this past 10 years has gone quickly. Um, usually, as you know, we typically have other presenters where I always present or a panel to talk. This year, I wanted to do it myself, and there's a reason I wanted to do it myself. One is because the issue we're talking about today, and that is, are we heading into a recession? It is imperative if you are in the world of business allocating capital resources. I don't care if you're looking at building a new manufacturing plant, you're looking at doing a real estate development, investing money in the equity markets, for us a bank making loans. If you don't understand economic cycles and get those economic cycles right, you can blow your business up and melt yourself down financially. If you get it right, as we all know, the best and biggest money can be made is buying assets at the bottom of a cycle. So for me, understanding economic cycles are imperative. As Carson mentioned, I spent 20 plus years running a long short equity hedge fund. I spent endless amounts of time digesting data. I'm a data junkie, I'm an economic junkie. Why do I digest all that data? To understand where the economy is going so I can make good sound decisions. I'll use a prime example, this bank, SunWest. In 2005, I'd been doing a lot of analysis of the housing market. Actually, it started in 2004. I started writing about it, analyzing it, and I started realizing we're in the midst of a very significant bubble that was going to have very significant consequences when it ended. As a result, we stopped making all kind of residential construction loans in the third quarter of 2005. Thankfully, we never made another one because that last loan we made went into default. That's third quarter of 2005. All the banks that continued to make those loans through the end of 2005, 2006, 2007, so many of them blew up or had to be rescued by the federal government. We instead were in a position of strength, so when banks were failing, we bought five failed banks. One in Idaho, one in Arizona, one in Washington, and two here in California. So the swing in economic fortunes by making that decision, understanding where things were going, were significant for this bank. So that's why I wanted to talk today about are we going into recession, give you the data, help you make your own decisions. I'm, and let me get to the other reason why I want to talk, is I'm going to make a prediction. I have sat through more economists, analysts, Wall Street analysts, uh, pre presentations where you spend a half hour, hour long looking at all their data, and when it comes to say, hey, are we going into a recession or not? They won't tell you. Well, maybe it's all over. It gets very wishy-washy. 
And I always walk away, can't they just put a stake in the ground? Well, for me, I've always been used to allocating capital. And I've had to put a stake in the ground with my balance sheets at my banks, at my hedge fund, wherever. In my real estate development company, am I going to develop a project or not? So I'm used to it. So if I get it wrong, I'm willing to accept I'm going to be embarrassed. Okay, I'll put my stake in the ground and I'm going to tell you what I think, whether we're going to go in a recession or not. So that's the reason today uh, on our 10 year anniversary, I said, you know what, let me just give the, the speech because I, I wanted to try to be as informative as I can but also let you know exactly my views on the equity markets, where rates are going, and are we going into a recession or not. So let's get moving on some economic data. All right. Okay, so why are we talking about the potential of a recession? Ever since March, if you read any kind of financial news or watch CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever data you read, you have been hearing about something called the inverted yield curve. Everybody has heard that, right? Many, many times. So what is an inverted yield curve? First of all, what's a yield curve? A yield curve is the difference between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. You normally, in any kind of normal market, longer term interest rates are going to have what is called a term premium. That means you're going to get paid more for giving your money to somebody else for a longer duration of time. If you're giving money for one year, you're gonna get X rate. If you're gonna give it for 10 years, you want a premium above that X rate. So in normal economic cycles, the 10 year treasury yield will always be above short-term rates. You could measure it off of short, uh, overnight LIBOR, 30-day LIBOR, one year, but typically the markets, when they talk about a yield curve, they tend to talk about the two-year treasury versus the 10-year treasury. So if you're looking at this graph, the two-year treasury is the one in the red line. The 10-year treasury is the one in the blue line. These gray graphs represent recessions. Oop, don't trip myself. Every one of these gray graphs is a recession. This goes back to 1980 for those that can't see in the back. So why is this inverted yield curve causing so much concern when it happened in March? Because seven of the last recessions the US economy has gone into the yield curve has inverted prior to that recession. It tends to invert anywhere from three to 12 months before a recession begins. It is, without question, the most consistent predictor of a recession. Now, in saying that, not every time the yield curve has inverted have we gone into a recession. There were two times in the 1960s it inverted temporarily and we didn't end up in recession. But for the last seven recessions, that happened, an inverted yield curve prior to that event. Now it's hard to look at all these squiggly lines, so I'm gonna move you to another graph that helps show it a little bit better. Okay, this is the spread. It's just showing the differential between the two and 10 year. So you only have one line to deal with. Again, gray graphs, recessions. As you can see, in most cases, the spread is positive. This line, axis line, is zero. When the spread goes negative, that means long-term rates are lower than the 10-year treasury yield is lower than the two-year. And in normal times, it's up here. But as you can see, as the spread collapsed be below zero, recession after each time. All right, moving on. So again, why are we worrying about a recession and why is the yield curve, why did it invert in March and has stayed kind of inverted on and off until this recent Fed rate cut that just happened, which uninverted it. 
because if you look at it, US GDP has been really good. Unemployment, 50 year low. Wage growth, 3% plus year over year. Strong US consumer. Let's look at the data. Here's GDP, US GDP. Over the last 20 quarters, we've had average growth of 2.32%. From the end of the Great Recession through 2016, average growth rate was 1.4. And then once President Trump got elected, 2017, the G, uh, GDP picked up and we've been averaging 2.56. I'm not promoting President Trump, it, you know, whether you like him or not, the one thing, he has been good with the economy for two big reasons in my view. He's de helped deregulate by all estimates and all studies. Uh, the cost of regulation on the US economy runs about 1.8 to 2.2 trillion dollars a year. Our US economy is about 21 and a half trillion. So it's a huge economic weight, the amount of regulations we deal with. For all of you in California, you just know what the, all the regulations here in this state alone have to deal with. So his deregulation program and obviously his tax reform act was very good for businesses and stopped motivating business from moving ashore. Because as I like to say, capital can flow anywhere. If you're going to invest in a plant and if you're being taxed at 36% corporate rate here in America, and you can build the plant and call it Canada and be taxed at, what is it, 18% or 20% in Canada and ship those goods back in the US, why would you build the plant in the US? So because they reformed corporate tax rates, lowered that, it's taken away the incentive for a lot of businesses to move their factories and jobs out of this market. So we've had a uptick in GDP uh, during his presidency. Now we've had a little bit downtick that broke below 2%. It was 1.9 this last quarter. But there's two events going on that probably impacted that. One, we had the GM strike. And the GM strike was for most of uh, third quarter. And that's a big event. And secondly, we have the problems with Boeing. And Boeing is, as a peer company, our biggest exporter. And with all the issues they've been having, it's been crushing down their production. So those two events have probably hit GDP without question by at least uh, a couple, uh, two tenths of a percent. So if they weren't there, my guess is we'd be up over 2%. So again, good economic growth. GDP looks good. Unemployment rate, you hear about that? President Trump likes to tout it. We're at a 50 year low in unemployment. 50 year low. So very positive trend. Uh, we just reported on Friday, which has helped the yield curve uninvert a bit, 128,000 jobs. Well, most analysts were forecasting well under 100,000, again, because of the GM strike. You had a lot of GM employees on strike and that they anticipated was gonna hit the job market. If you took GM out of it, most people forecast it somewhere between 50 to 60,000 jobs that will flow back in. So really strong numbers. Averagely, our earnings per year, big issue. And it's one of the things, in my view, that has fueled uh, the animosity to the capital market system, the free market system, which, by the way, I'm going to be very clear, I am a huge advocate of. I'm not going to turn this into a political discussion, but the thought that we are actually having discussions about socialism when it's failed in every country in the world is absurd. Uh, and our free market system is by far the best. Don't get me wrong. We have issues and we have problems. But to think that uh, a free market system and socialism have any comparable from economic outlook, economic freedom, prosperity for its people is, a, you know, our night and day difference. But what I was saying is what has probably been fueling some of this is up until the last couple years, you, we went from 1997 
to 2017 with almost no wage growth. You had a spike in wage growth in 98, 99, 2000, recession, collapsed it down. You had some wage growth in 2004, 2005, 2006, not that strong, got collapsed down in the Great Recession. Finally, we came out of the Great Recession in 2010. You had some modest wage growth. And finally, we have picked up, we're, we're running at over 3% uh, every year. Really good, strong numbers for the American consumer. And this last graph is showing it. It's consumer confidence. This takes you back to 2004. In uh, the 2004, 2005, and then all of a sudden, 2007, you had this collapse. Now we've moved back, and we're back up over the levels that we were back up in the last uh, good expansion. So again, all this great economic data. Why is the yield curve? Why did it invert? Why are we talking recession? Well, the issue for me is let's look overseas. The European econ economy, uh, the Eurozone, because it's a series of different economies, obviously, has been at or in recession. China, which has been the engine of economic growth for 25 years, has sp started to decline and may be in a very significant world of hurt, which they won't necessarily tell you. So let's go look at the data there. All right, this first graph is uh, Eurozone PMI. PMI is Purchasing Manufacturer Index. It's looking at their broad manufacturing index and rolling it all up into one index. You got PMI here in the US. This is a new index uh, that just got started in 2016 because uh, usually they would measure each country individually. So as you can see, uh, you had this nice spike. Oh, by the way, the midline right here is 50. I, sh I should have bolded that. But anything above 50 means expansion. Anything below 50 means contraction. So as you can see, here in 2018, like the first, second quarter of 18, you started to see a contraction in the manufacturing sectors of Europe. Now let's get into their four biggest economies. You got four major economies in Europe. Germany being the biggest, it's at about four and a half trillion dollars. The UK, France, both about three trillion, Italy at 2.6. So these three are pretty close. Well, the biggest engine for economic growth in Germany, uh, or in, Euro in Europe, is Germany. As you can see, okay, here's zero line for GDP. As you can see, that line's almost at zero right now. Some people believe Germany already has entered a recession. United Kingdom, all of a sudden, its growth rates are starting to fall again, well below 2%. Obviously, there are some concerns about Brexit uh, and them separating from the rest of Europe. Now, here's an unusual one. I got to be honest, when I was pulling the data and I saw this, because I hadn't realized this, France, which has been typically a basket case, has, has ticked up. And I was like, what the heck is going on? How did the French finally get start generating some economic growth? I think there's two reasons for it. One is President Marcon has started to enact some labor reform. Most companies would never want to build a factory in France. Heck, restaurant owners, the, the French chefs at, were leaving there to go to London and other markets because you can't fire a bad, you could not fire a bad employee in France. I mean, if you had the world's worst employee, you, had to be, you were guaranteed you were going to be paying them for at least two years and probably a lot more. So companies all just started saying, we, we don't want anything to do with France. And even French companies were trying to get out. So Marcon came in, and one of the big things he started working on is reforming their labor market and making it a little bit more flexible and the ability to terminate uh, unproductive employees. I think that has helped tick them up. 
as well as I think the concerns about Brexit that the fact it's going to go through, I think a number of big multinational corporations that are headquartered in London are starting to put some operations in Paris because it's the only logical other major capital in Europe to operate off of. So, you know, the big banks are saying we've got to have some X operations in Paris. So I think that has helped tick them up a bit. And Italy, where my wife and I just came from three weeks. Let me tell you, it was wonderful. And Italian food and red wine is superb. But uh, that's, you know, the Italians, the poor Italians, uh, they're back to a zero growth rate. And their economy has just been continuing to struggle. It was sad meeting young people there and them talking about, yeah, I, I may leave Italy. It's a country of my home. I love it. But Again, they have so much dysfunction in their economic system and their labor markets and a whole host of things. So as you see, all these four major economies, with the exception of this little uptick in France, are at or close uh, to a recession. So why does that matter and what's the implication of it? What these lines are, and I don't want to get too technical, this is the ECB, the European Central Bank. It is the equivalent of their Federal Reserve. So when you see here ECB, European Central Bank, it's their Federal Reserve. This is interest rates. This is 2004. Zero is this line. One percent is this line. Two percent. So they had increasing interest rates then pummeled down through the Great Recession. Their economies were not coming out of it. They started picking them up a little bit, seeing some signs of life in 2013, late 12 and 13. The economy started soft and they brought them back down again. And by the way, the blue line is the deposit rate. The red line is the refinance rate. What does that mean? The red line refinance rate means when the banks come to borrow from the ECB. The blue line is when the banks park their excess liquidity at the ECB and what the ECB, the central bank, pays the banks. So all of a sudden, you see here in 2016, the refinance rate, what they borrow from the ECB is flat, is zero. They're borrowing at zero rate and all of a sudden they take their deposit rate below zero. That means when a bank wants to park its reserves at the ECB, they're paying the ECB to hold their money. So everybody was expecting, me included, as economic growth was happening here, that would start seeing rates rise. And unfortunately, they were planning on it but they couldn't because the economy started to weaken too much. So the central bank kept rates low and actually took down the deposit rate lower. Now we're gonna look at the ECB's balance sheet and I'm gonna have to explain something technical most of you will easily get, but it has probably had as big of an impact financially and economically to all of you than just about anything else as long as you own assets. And that is something called central bank expansion of their balance sheet or quantitative easing. How many people have heard of quantitative easing? Okay, most of you have heard it. What is quantitative easing? Quantitative easing is when a central bank goes into the markets and buys securities. In most cases, it's bonds, government bonds. And in the US case, they went in and bought mortgage-backed securities. They buy them off the bank's balance sheets and take them on to the central bank's balance sheets. When you do that, what are, what's happening? They're giving cash to the banking system to the financial system. So they're taking these assets onto their balance sheet, they're shoving liquidity into the capital market system. So what do the banks do with all this cash? 
they're supposed to go out and lend because if they're not getting paid on sitting on cash, they have to go invest it. Quantitative easing has had more to do with the lift in the equity markets, in the real estate markets, in almost any asset market than anything else over the last decade. And I'll show you when we get to the Fed's balance sheet. So this is the ECB's balance sheet. You know, 2001, all the way up until about 2017, it was running a little bit under a trillion dollars. Then it was starting to move up during the heart of the financial crisis. Then pop, it goes up over two trillion. And then it goes up over three trillion. And then they started to try to contract their balance sheet, but that wasn't working. And then they had to gun it and they've gunned their balance sheet where it's now over four and a half trillion dollars. That's four and a half trillion dollars that have been shoved in to the European financial system. Why does this matter to you? Because it has created something called negative rates. And it's the explanation what has happened to our 10-year treasury. All right, it may be hard to see these yields back there and I apologize. This is a chart of 10-year global yields. Countries are Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Japan, Belgium, France, Spain, United Kingdom. I threw Greece in here just to show how absurd things have gotten. And then United States and China, all right? Nothing against the Greeks, but uh, I think everybody knows they've been bankrupt for over 12 years and they have no chance of ever repaying anybody. Right now, if you see red lines, and in this case, Switzerland is at a negative 52 basis points, that means if you give the Swiss government your money for 10 years, you buy a 10-year Swiss bond, you're paying them. Think of that for two seconds. You're giving your money for 10 years, and every year you are paying them a half a percent to hold your money. Now think of how absurd that is. Germany, 35 basis points. Denmark, 33 basis points. Netherlands, 22. Japan, 19. This is what has happened to our treasury yield. We were floating along at, you know, a 2.8, 3%, got up to three and a quarter percent 10 year treasury yield. Our economy was going well. And all of a sudden, it started to dive. It went down, broke, broke below three. It went to kind of the 280, 270. Then it broke again, down to the 250, 270. Then it broke again. 250 to two and a quarter, then broke to two and a quarter to two, then it broke below two, and it went all the way down to 1.4 some odd percent at one point back in late spring. What was happening is European investors were saying, I'm not getting any yield. I'm having to pay my government to hold my money. So, hey, America's the strongest, the biggest, most liquid financial market in the world, the US government debt, even though we're kind of bankrupt, but a lot better than most of them. Hey, it's the safest spot. They got the biggest military and they've got yields. And so you had a wave of money cr crash into America, just starting to bid down our 10 year treasury yield. I'd mentioned Greece. If you give the Greek government money for 10 years, you're getting paid 1.18%. Now, who would give somebody who's bankrupt money and only charge them 1.8%, 1.18%? Maybe if it's your troubled brother that you're just trying to help him out. <laughs> but I don't think you're giving anybody else at that rate that kind of money. A, a country like that, you know, you'd be thinking 15, 18, 20% yield usury yields, uh, hoping you get paid back. But that's uh, how absurd. And by the way, just to explain what these other graphs are, this is the, 50, the 12 month change of what happened because at one point a year ago, 
all these countries still had positive rates. Germany had a positive 77 base points. Not a lot of money. You're getting paid less than 1% for giving your money to them for a year. But at least you're getting paid something. Back in late spring, that went to a negative 72 basis points. Now, the good thing is it's rallied back a little bit, so it's now only a negative 35 basis points, still negative. So to me, that has been the big driver of what's call, caused the 10-year Treasury yield to collapse down below our short-term rate. But there's another reason as well. Good old China. China's been the global growth engine for 25 years, the fastest growing economy in the world and a meaningful economy. It's now the second largest economy in the world. They're at about 14 trillion uh, GDP per year. Again, we're at about 21 and a half trillion. But it, it's blown well past Japan and, and almost every place else in the world except for the US. These growth rates, I mean, this is 16%, this is zero. You could see this huge growth rate kind of dip down, but they're still, you know, averaging 8%, picked it back up over 14%, got clobbered in the financial crisis, but hey, they were still growing in the financial crisis. They were still probably growing, you know, at around 5 or 6%. Then they had the spike out of the financial crisis, and then it has been starting to fade. So it's say, they're saying right now they're growing at 6%. The problem is when you get data from China, it's a little hard to believe. Uh, has anybody been to China? Have you read the newspapers in China? Because if you do, you'll realize they're fundamentally different <laughs> than the US. Uh, my wife's brother ran IBM for China or the, the Chinese market for IBM. So we went and visited. And he said, you got to see this. And the papers, everything's perfect. Every day, it's blue sky. You walk out and go, it's a steel gray sky, because it's so much pollution, I can't see the blue sky. <laughs> but it's, you know, they always present the positive, because the uh, Communist Party, the central government, controls the press in its entirety. So they dictate the narrative. So they're going to tell you what's going on, whether it's true or not, and they're always going to try to paint the positive. There's nobody believes that they're going at 6% that studies China or economic data. There's a few ways to get at it, so let's look and understand what's really going on with China. This is one data point the Chinese government doesn't control because the private sector controls it. It's automobiles. China is the largest automobile market in the world. It has totally eclipsed the US. As you can see, again, this is zero. This is the rate of sales. That's 100%, over 100%. So they have been averaging very fast rate of growth. That's 20%, this line. This next line is 20%. That's how much sales they were generating on a year-over-year -year basis. Now it's gone negative. And some of these negative numbers are significant. 15 months in a row, you've had uh, negative auto sales. And some of these down months are, you know, 7% year over year, like the latest one, and one was 10% down. So if the Chinese economy is really growing at 6%, do you think their auto market would be getting collapsed like that? Probably not. Another index that I didn't throw in here was the energy market. You can look at energy usage. Usually, energy usage uh, pretty well tracks to GDP. The more hot an economy is running, the more energy is being used, the less uh, strong an economy is, the, the lower energy usage. Right now, energy uh, usage consumption in uh, uh, China is running at about 3%. But here's where we can get some really good data that we don't have to rely on the Chinese government. And that are the four probably most key economies to China. Australia, Singapore, Japan, South Korea. Now, you could arguably throw Brazil in there. You could definitely throw Taiwan and a few others. But these are big, significant economies. How are they interlinked with China? Well. 
Australia is China's commodity box. All the goods that China makes, some of it comes out of their own natural country, but it's largely been flowing out of Australia number one and Brazil number two. So when they have to get their metals, mining, all the rest, that's coming right out of Australia. Australia economic growth has been very strong. They had the best housing market, probably one of the most stable economies in the Western world for 20 years. They rode it with China's upswing. Well, right now, the Australian economy is barely above 1%. They've collapsed interest rates. Their housing market, which hadn't had a meaningful decline in 25 years, has been down 12.5%. That tells you something's going on with China. Singapore. Why is Singapore relevant? Because a lot of goods that come out of China go through Singapore and a lot of finished manufacturing, very high tech and manufacturing stage goes through Singapore. Singapore just printed uh, a, a negative GDP print, so it should be below on this graph, of 3.7%. So why is Singapore printing a negative uh, rate of GDP if, if China's doing well. And then you've got Japan, the third largest economy in the world, at about five trillion, and South Korea. These are two big exporters into China, very big. Now, Japan has been kind of broken for 25 years, sadly. They've got demographic issues, a whole host. But their economy has been bouncing and dipping down, and South Korea has really started to slow down. And when you look at what they're exporting to China, what's driving their slowdown is the collapse in exports to China. In fact, Singapore's exports to China was down 22%. So again, if China's grown at 6%, why are all these other data that you can get all negative or flatlined? Point is, they're not growing at 6%. They're probably growing barely above zero, or they may be in a true recession contraction. Why is that meaningful? Well, again, money, some money's coming out of there because all these central governments are lowering rates, all the rest. But this is causing a concern that with China rolling over, the whole global economy may roll into a global recession. U.S. economy is a percentage of world GDP. Pie graph. Back after, we, uh, after the end of World War II, most of the world's economies were destroyed. America was by far the biggest, strongest economy. But if we moved some years after 1960, America was slightly over 40% of world GDP. By 1970, we're 35% of world GDP. By 1980, we're 30%. Today, we're 22. It's not that our economy has shrunken. It's just that the rest of the world's economies have grown, and some a lot faster, like China. China's at 14%. Euro Europe. Uh, is 15%, but including Germany, it's 19%. Japan, 5%. The rest of the globe, you know, other Asian countries, African, Middle Eastern, South American countries make up about 40%. So the question people are wrestling with when they're allocating capital is, if the rest of the globe is going into a global recession, will the United States be able to navigate out of it? Will we be able to not be pulled into recession with everybody else? That's a tough question to answer. So let's go back to the US and start looking at some leading indicators, not lagging indicators, to try to answer this. OK, what is leading indicators and what are lagging indicators? A big lagging indicator is unemployment rate. Why is the unemployment rate a lagging indicator? Because companies don't all of a sudden go, oh, we think we're going in recession. Let's go fire a bunch of people. No, that's the last thing to happen once they're in a recession, is to start terminating people. They first 
And I'll get into it with temp employment, how that works through, so I'll save that. But that's a lagging indicator. There are leading indicators that happen right at the beginning when you're heading into recession that are maybe not as good predictors as an inverted yield curve, but pretty good predictors all the same. All right, so there's the shipping, cash shipping. Manufacturing, ISM, P, PMI, US, durable goods, temporary employment. I'll walk you through each one. Okay, cash shipping index, what is that? That's tracking all forms of shipping pricing. Baltic freight rate, so that's uh, tracking the rates of shipping goods via uh, boat, by vessel, over the seas. Airplane rates of shipping goods. Uh, trucking rates, um, railroad rates. Typically, once you start slowing into the economy, those rates and the usage of shipping starts to decline. So we had a really nice pick-me-up here. Uh, in fact, it was looking, and I thought we were possibly heading into a recession at the end of uh, 16. Uh, and again, this is not a political, but I think because of when President Trump said, you know, I'm all about the economy, we're going to deregulate, we're going to do all these things that picked up business confidence. So you had a spike up and you had some really good, strong numbers. But all of a sudden, for the last 10 months, the shipping index is going down. And even though you see this pick up, that's still down because it's below zero. That's a year over year number. I know that may be a little confusing, but anything below zero is still negative. It's just less negative than the last month. So we've had, you know, 10 consecutive months of contraction. Case has said the trend has moved from warning of a potential slowdown to signaling an economic contraction. Now this is ISM manufacturing index. Again, gray bars recession. When ISM starts to decline, it's a leading indicator. It tends to show Things are slowing up. And uh, this is 50 again. Anything above 50 is positive. Anything below 50 is contraction. This is looking at the broader manufacturing world. What's happening? So we're having negative influence. Now again, you got to remember we have had some things going on. Boeing and GM both will impact that, particularly Boeing. Durable goods. Durable goods are large, more expensive goods that last for three years or more. Certain kinds of computer equipment, uh, bigger pieces of machinery. Uh, it's heavier investment. Again, a good leading indicator when things are going into recession. Durable goods, again, this is zero. It has now gone below zero. All three points not looking very good. Temporary employment. This is a leading indicator. Why? You're a business. You're running hot. Things are going well. You're trying to hire people. You can't fill every job. You're having to use temp employment. So you, you bring them on a temporary basis to fill positions because you can't get all the positions filled, particularly in a 50-year low unemployment rate. But this happens in any booming economy. All of a sudden, you start seeing a little signs of softness. OK, well, we're not running quite as hot. Our factories aren't, are slowing down a little bit, less goods being pushed through. All right, well, what's the easiest way to tweak it? Temporary employment. They're the easiest to get rid of. They're not on a contractual basis. You don't have to pay them money. You don't have all the benefit issues. So temp employment starts to roll over before recessions happen, when unemployment rates you really don't see starting to plummet or employment starting to plummet until you're kind of mid-cycle in, in, a, in a recession. So this one, still looking good. Still, you know, everything looking pretty good. 
So because of all these negative data points, because of what's happening in Europe, because of what's happening with China, what has our central bank done? The Federal Reserve. OK, this is 2001. This is 2019. This is the Fed funds rate. And if you recall, prior to uh, you know, the tech bubble, the economy was booming, 1999, 2000, we created a tech bubble. All of a sudden, it burst. The Fed, Alan Greenspan, collapsed rates. Some would argue, and I would argue, collapsed them way too far. He wanted void. He was getting ready to leave. He wanted to go out on a positive note. And he kept rates down too long. As a result, that fueled a huge housing boom. And that was the beginning of it. And a variety of other things came into play. So then they started taking rates up, got them up about to five and a quarter. And then all of a sudden, the housing market fell apart. And they took rates all the way down to 25 basis points. There's always a range, 0 to 25. They're, they're, with the Fed funds rate, they don't, don't nail it to the basis point. But it's always a range, a 25 basis point range. So they took it to 0 to 25 range. And they kept it that way. Many would argue, and I would argue, that they made a huge mistake in not starting to raise rates earlier. Uh, but they did only one 25 basis point rate increase in 2015. Then all of a sudden, in 2017, the economy started picking up more speed, all the rest, and they started raising rates. It's one of the reasons probably President Trump hates the Fed so much because he's like, you know, I've been having to eat all these massive rate increases uh, in my economy. And, uh, but frankly, I don't care what he's complaining about. They should have ra raised rates. It's absolutely essential. So they took rates up. And we got to a two, 225 to 250 range in the 10 year. Then all of a sudden, they did their last rate increase in December. A lot of people were complaining about it. Last year, at this time, you had a lot of problems in the equity markets. If you recall, the, the, the stock market started to selling off uh, fairly significantly, and so a lot of problems. Finally, I think the Fed realized what was happening over the globe, and then they saw the inverted yield curve, and then they started to get very concerned. So as a result, the Fed has done now three rate cuts. Uh, and they just finished their last rate cut in October. So as a result of that, the inverted yield curve is no longer inverted because they've taken short rates down by 75 basis points. And the 10 year has picked up a bit because people are saying, maybe we'll now avoid the recession. And some of the negative yields in Europe have become a little bit less severe. This is the Fed's balance sheet. Again, remember, quantitative easing has a huge impact on to asset values, massive impact to asset values. And I don't care if it's a piece of real estate, if it's a stock, bond, you name it, this has a huge impact. So the Fed's balance sheet was always running around six, 700 billion. And then all of a sudden, the financial crisis started, boom. They took it up over two, two and a half, uh, to over two and a half trillion. Then that was quantitative easing one. Then it started uh, dipping down again. They had to do quantitative easing two, and then three, and then they went into what is open-ended quantitative easing, where every single month for a long duration of time, the Fed was buying 40 uh, billion of treasuries a month and 40 billion of MBSs, mortgage-backed securities, a month. They were pumping massive amounts of liquidity into our financial system. And then all of a sudden, they kind of flatlined it and stopped and started to shrink the balance sheet in 2018. Another thing that President Trump was uh, complaining about, again, they should have been shrinking their balance sheet. 
I have a problem with a lot of what they have done because I don't think you ever can get out of it. Well, they started shrinking it and they can't get out of it because what ended up happening, I don't, again, it's a technical thing. We started having significant problems in what is called the repo market. It's the overnight market when banks borrow from each other, they pledge treasury securities to get cash. So we were having cash shortages in the repo market. The Fed had to step in and start supplying $75 billion for the overnight repo market. Every day the Fed is in the financial system, the plumbing of the financial system, and right now it's injecting about $7.5 billion a day. Then they had to come out and say, hey, we're just gonna start buying treasuries again at a clip of $60 billion a month. So what's happening? And this just has all started happening in October. That balance sheet is starting to rise again. And here's one of the big problems. Why are they having to do this? This is a schedule of US Treasury maturities T-bills, notes, bonds. This is 2019. This is only the next two months. This is not the full year. If it was the full year, it'd be up here. This is just November and December. This is 2020. This is 2022 and then goes out. These are half billion, trillion, trillion and a half, two trillion, two and a half trillion, three trillion, three and a half trillion. This is how much debt they have to roll that comes due. We have, because we've racked up so much debt in our country, $23 trillion, and a shame on both political parties, none of them have taken managing our fiscal affairs appropriately. We have created such a debt crisis that now the Fed is gonna have to be in there because where are we gonna find all the buyers for this? So the Fed is having to become the buyer of our own debt, which essentially it's a long conversation, but the base is your value of your currency over time. So as a result of this, the Fed has taken down interest rates and they're pumping their balance sheet again. What are they trying to effect with that? Give confidence, keep stocks up, as well as going back to the housing market and any consumer market. So auto sales and auto loans, they started to fade as the Fed was taking rates up and, uh, and shrinking their balance sheet. And the default rates were starting to increase. And then obviously the housing market started to fail and started having problems. So, when you look at housing, new housing construction, oh, 5% of GDP. But when you think of new and existing housing and you roll in all the aspects of it, brokerage, title insurance, other forms of insurance, furniture, landscaping, I could go on and on, it rolls up to about 25% of GDP. If you can stimulate the housing market and you can stimulate the auto market, you'll put some initiative and punch back into GDP and they're trying to avoid the recession by going back to the housing market. This is the 30 year mortgage rate. As you see, it's collapsed back down. Building permits are now starting to pick back up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got too fast, got too fast, it's coming. I, I, I've got some eyes out there going, okay, guy, would this guy shut up? This is a lot of economic data, but it's coming. All right, so uh, this is existing home sales. One of the problems we've had in the housing market is the lack of supply. Uh, people that own them don't want to sell it. Uh, right here in California is a prime example because of uh, what will do to the reset of your property taxes, and there's nothing to buy on the other side. So you've had a really lack of supply and just going through the entitlement process, I'm not gonna get into CEQA and all these things that have prevented uh, new housing supply to come into a market like California. 
Uh, but this has been a problem all over. But you're starting to see a pick back up in housing and new housing starts. You know, all the big home builders reported their third quarter numbers. They're all gunning back up again. So that's what the Fed is trying to do. All right, so since I already clicked through, let's get to predictions. We're almost at an end, folks, and then we'll go into Q&A. As Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> Only Yogi Berra could say it so dang well. So hopefully I've given you a lot of economic data so you can form your own conclusions on what's going to happen. But here's my view on what I think will happen. For the next four quarters, the U.S. economy will avoid entering into a recession. But it will slow to probably a one to one and a half percent growth rate. Why do I think we'll avoid it? Because Europe's trying to re-stimulate, China's trying to re-stimulate, we have taken rates down, which definitely will re-stimulate some of the consumer side of the economy. In saying that, there are areas of weakness that I think will continue to drag on us around the globe that will pull our growth rate that has been averaging at about 2.5% down to probably more 1.5%. Now, don't get me wrong. One quarter may be well above it. One quarter may be low it. I'm talking about an average for the next four quarters. I think we will avoid a recession. I'm sure most of you thought I was probably going to say recession because a lot of those leading indicators, but because of some of the actions that the Fed is taking, and I'm not saying I agree with it, I'm just stating it will have an impact and what's going on around the rest of the globe, I think we will probably avoid a recession for the next four quarters. So, so that takes us through third quarter of next year, 2020. For the fourth quarter of 2020 and 2021, the risk of recession grows, but will depend on politics. We have a presidential election. The consequences of that could be fairly significant. Here's my prediction there. If President Trump wins, we'll likely continue with a period of modest economic growth for at least some three, four quarters after that. But I do think we will end up in a recession at some point because at some point we're going to have to start dealing with the level of deficits. But I think it will be shallower recession, and I don't know if it will come right at the beginning of his presidency. If a moderate Democrat like Biden wins and he stays moderate, then I believe it will produce similar uh, results, maybe slightly lower, but maybe similar results. Uh, and hopefully avoid a recession. If Senator Warren or Sanders wins, then I believe we will go into a period of significant economic contraction. Now, you can say, oh, I'm just being political and that's my political views. No, I'm just going to ask you to use your own mind. If you're a business person and you're having to make capital allocation decisions, Am I going to build this new building? Am I going to build this new plant? Am I going to hire new people? Am I going to buy stocks? If you're being told massive arm of government's going to come and start regulating the heck out of everything again, and by the way, we're going to increase tax rates very significantly right on you and on capital formation, why would you take that risk? I'll, I'll be very clear. For me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a, build another real estate project if I think that's going to happen. I would probably tighten our lending standards very tight where only the best of the best can get a loan it, it, because uh, you, you, the risk of a big significant recession. And from my equity markets position, I'll take everything that I'm long, I'll switch it short, and I'll go short the market significantly. I'm just telling you what I would do. I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm just saying that is reality, and every single significant business guy I know when we've had this discussion has all said the exact same thing, because it's logical. So 
We don't know what's going to happen with the presidential election. The interesting thing for President Trump, he has a conundrum. If Warren or Sanders wins the primary, it will already start taking an impact on GDP in that third quarter. Because you, you, you know if somehow one of those two win, it's going to be too late on some of these decisions, so people will start hedging their bet pretty quickly. So he's going to have the battle of, you know, not only all his issues that he already has created for himself, but he's going to have the issue that the economy may start slowing in that third quarter because the capital markets are worried about uh, one of these two winning if they win the primary, which would happen in August, but most people will have that figured out somewhere in June or July. So that's my predictions on economic growth. Uh, we will avoid a recession, uh, but we will slow down. Prediction on interest rates. I think the Fed will pause now for the next few months. I do not see the forecast for a rate increase next year. I think they could cut one more, possibly two more times but I think they will stage that over the year and see what the economic data is. For the 10-year, right now, I think we're gonna be range-bound. 150 on the low side, and, and give me some slack if it's 140, high 130s, but kind of 150 on the low side, on the high side, two. Now, if I had to make a prediction beyond that, which way it could break out, it could break out in either direction, and let me tell you, I feel a little humbled standing up here predicting long-term interest rates, because last year, I got it just flat wrong. I was hoping to buy a lot of 10-year treasuries up at three and a half, it never got there, and I kept hoping, and I've had to reset, reset, and now I'm just hoping I get to two to start buying 10-year treasuries again. So. Uh, I feel a little humbled making a prediction about the 10-year treasuries because I was so flat wrong last year. Uh, but I do think it's range-bound. It could break out because of the amount of debt roll we have to do, so it could break out to the upside. But if all of a sudden China and everybody melts down, yes, it could break to the downside as well. But I think we'll largely be range-bound for some period of time. And right now, today, we're at a 186 on the 10-year and the two years at 160, so we actually have a positive spread. Again, once the Fed took rates down with its last cut, it uninverted a flat yield curve. All right, now here's a, another dangerous prediction to make, but I'll just give you my thoughts. Again, if you come up to me at any point in the next year and said, hey, I made an investment bet based on what you said, and I hold you accountable, I, I'm gonna say, hey, I caveated this, all right? So it's up to you, it's your own money. I'm just giving you the data, you make your own informed decision. But uh, the equity markets have had a massive run, obviously. This was the run up in the 90s, the collapse after uh, the internet bubble burst the run-up, uh, and then the housing bubble burst, and now we've had a parabolic run. Again, half of this parabolic run is because of what the Fed did with its balance sheet. So if we wouldn't have had that, my guess is, you know, S&P, which is just right at 3,000, would probably be more at 2,000 or maybe even left without, you know, four trillion dollars of liquidity slammed into our financial system. And, and all the money that's come out of Europe. But uh, the equity markets at all time record highs. My prediction for next year in the equity markets. Now last year I got this one, well, nailed it pretty well. If you recall what I said last year, I said I thought that uh, would have a, a, a sell off in the equity markets, a lot more volatility, but would probably end the year not too different than where we were at that point, which we ended a little bit higher, but a not a lot higher, but we did have a big sell off. It actually happened a little bit faster than I assumed, and we had that big dip down through November and December. But what do I think? Well, you've got two, you've got one big positive for the equity markets, and one big negative for the equity markets. The positive, the Fed's pumping money again. 
So more liquidity, chasing assets, the same supply of assets. What's the negative? Slower US and global economic growth. 50% of S&P earnings comes overseas. So if the rest of the globe is slowing down, that's hitting their earnings. And obviously, with the US economy slowing, if it does slow, that will hit their earnings. So you got these two big cross currents colliding. Then we've got three major catalysts that will move the market around one way or the other. A trade agreement is reached or not reached with China. Part of the reason for the uptick, uptick is it looks like they've got a mini partial agreement that they're going to ink, but you never know, because we've heard that many times before. Second is, do uh, impeachment proceedings fade and just end in the House, or does it become a real probability that President Trump could be impeached? Again, we'll enter a lot more uh, uncertainty in the markets. And lastly, for the election at the end of next year, does Trump or a moderate Democrat win versus a progressive Democrat? Three catalysts that could move the equity markets or will move the equity markets significantly in one way or the other. So what's my prediction about it? One, I can guarantee you'll have a lot more volatility. <laughs> That's a given. Two, I think we'll probably have a bit of a rally up. It's already started, I think, because the Fed's expanding their balance sheet. The yield curve is uninverted. Uh, you're seeing a bid back into the banking system, into certain retailers, and a whole series of different sections of the market. Tech, don't talk to me about, because I think it's all, a lot of it's very highly valued, but if more liquidity is coming in, it could still continue to move tech up. But, you know, that's one area I'm a little more concerned to opine on. By the end of, uh, or, so that's the, till the end of the year. And then I think we are set up for a pretty good potential pullback somewhere in second and third quarter. We are really hot all to the time highs with the equity markets. I don't think earnings, what the earnings estimates for next year are going to be able to be reached. I, um, and I think there's just too many events out there that will cause a pullback in the equity markets at some point. And my guess is it will probably ha happen second or third quarter. And fourth quarter, it will depend on the election. The election will matter a lot, a whole lot. So folks, I put myself out there. Take it for what you can. Uh, it's your investment decisions, it's your money. I hope I gave you enough information to allow you to make your own informed decision. And I hope I didn't bore you too much. So thank you very much for sitting here and listening to me. Now I'll open it up for questions and answers. <laughs>